problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to Sarah's Country, home of unwavering responsibility, I feel, to the farmers and growers of New Zealand. To hold the matters that matter most are at our core, our heart, yet the uncertainties of our futures collectively together in our hands. For those joining us from around the world or for the very first time, kia ora and welcome to learning more about the challenges and of course the exciting opportunities as well as we navigate the countryside of Aotearoa New Zealand. I'm your host Sarah Perriam and Sarah's Country is home to showcasing that deep innovation and classic Kiwi ingenuity that we know so well that of course tackle challenges but I believe sometimes often goes without praise to our wider whanau in this country. Humble is the old Coomera but hoping the world discovers our points of difference to the industrial agriculture and cheap convenience food that is produced in many parts of the world. Because you know what, if we don't actually celebrate our wins, no one is actually going to do this for us. However, uh, I know that you listening via podcast or watching live may have never thought yourself as a style icon. Well, if you have, good on you. I believe you are as well. But Gucci uh, has taken grassroots to another level. And I'm talking about this because it's an example of marketing and believing in your product well beyond what many might think it's worth. Gucci has taken grassroots to the catwalk with grass-stained jeans. Yes, you heard it right, but make sure you're sitting down. Sell for sale for twelve hundred dollars, New Zealand grass-stained jeans. Here's an example of the margin on a product that many of you, well, you may not because you wash your jeans, uh, but that grand-looking stained brand that is attracting significant premium. Now, I am saying this slowly for you to take this in. You think, oh, for God's sake, this is just blooming ridiculous. But it is absolutely true, and it is not the first time there's $700 taped up jeans. And, of course, many of you may have seen teenagers or even people who shouldn't be wearing them with built-in air conditioning jeans, you know, the ones with rips throughout them. Oil stained gloves, I think, could be the next thing for Metro males this winter because, you know, a girl likes a man that gets his hands dirty. And if you don't own a leaking Kingswood, then, you know, you can just buy the look off your shelf, off the shelf in Paris now. I mean, this is crazy to us who live and work in the country and understand what it is about getting your hands dirty and, of course, your knees green. Marketing 101, though, is about bringing the lifestyle to the people who can't live it. It sounds ridiculous. This world is ridiculous, though, and I think we need to play to it rather than wait for it to come to us, for us to discover it. We need to stand up and be more... A more un unhumble. A more unhumble. This is not even a word. Right. So, of course, I want to talk about fashion because fashion's very fun. Especially because I know there's a lot of different generations that listen uh, and watch the show live. And that's who I would like to talk to uh, in the comments throughout the rest of the hour. What is the most ridiculous fashion <laughs> that you have lived through? And what was it? Was it shoulder pads of the 80s? Uh, was it, of course, you know, bell bottom blues? Was that what they called in terms of pants? My apologies, in the 70s. Um, and a lot of trends coming back too. Uh, and, of course, uh, oversized blazers, very 80s that I'm wearing, uh, but of course classic timeless fashion, you know, the, the tart and cheese cutter, of course, cuts across multiple different decades. What is the most crazy, ugliest fashion you hope never comes back? Is it double denim, suspenders, uh, but the classic fashion, let's talk about that as well and how it always has that timeless nature. And of course, uh, how many of you have got $1,200 grass stained jeans lying around? You didn't know that you were sitting on. I'm turning to the stories tonight uh, in an alliance with the fantastic team at Farmers Weekly. After 7.20, they're calling it a fertiliser levy. This is the Green Party, but is it really just a disguised tax? Another one.
Uh, and of course, so the ban on palm kernel is just many of the reasons farmers are scrambling to understand where on earth the feed alternatives will be coming from in the Greens all uh, agricultural policy if they come into pay, play post-election. I caught up with co-leader for Grey, the Green Party, James Shaw, earlier today to talk about not only the $300 million pot to transition farmers to more organic and regenerative practices, but I wanted to cover off on water storage on the sequestration opportunities of native trees and of soil and of course when are we bringing wool into the uh, building for climate change policy. Now, Fonterra made a welcome return last week to profitability in the 2020 financial year, despite global disruption from COVID-19. However, multiple different scenarios in terms of a co-op restructure and a volatile GDT uh, sees a lot of uncertainty still, even though a very wide-ranging forecast. Joining us after 7.30 is Farmers Weekly journalist Hugh Stringleman, who will provide an overview uh, of this capital restructure of Fonterra, the director elections coming up and his th- thoughts around the forecast for the up and coming 2020-2021 season. To close the show at quarter to eight, an innovative new player in rural electricity supply has commissioned its first investor owned solar system into a North Canterbury dairy farm. Solar Agri Energy co founder Peter Saunders is going to join us towards the end of the show to share their business journey. Uh, first up on the show, she simplified her calf rearing operation so that she can farm more effectively with less labour, alongside the use of technology, yet the old ways uh, to achieve a 2020 Balanced Farm Environment Award uh, from an Innovation Award perspective. Angela Scott will join us next from the Mania Toto. This is Sarah's Country. for perfect beef and lamb. Take one small fresh country. Make sure it's nice and remote. Now, keep it at the ideal temperature all year round. Next, mix in the farmers. They go perfectly with the nature of this unique place. Add regular sprinkles of rain to really bring out the lush meadow grass. Then let your animals happily graze on this grass all day, every day. There you have it, New Zealand, the perfect recipe for beef and lamb. Taste pure nature. Kiwi Ingenuity mixed with a healthy dose of organisation means Angela Scott has simplified her calf rearing operation so she's farming more effectively with less labour. Sounds awesome. Farming a 470 hectare Maniatoto sheep and beef property that's been in her family for almost 100 years. Angela's ability to embrace new ideas was praised by this year's judges of the Balanced Farm Environment Awards where she took 
took out the Massey University Innovation Award. Really looking forward to hearing how she did that. And joining us now is Angela Scott from Pendella Farms. Welcome to Serious Country, Angela. Firstly, can you give us a little bit of a background into your day-to-day operation uh, down in central Otago? Um, thanks, Sarah. Well, I farm sheep and beef, so my sheep are super fine merinos, and um, I do bull beef, which is perhaps an, an odd mix. But um, that's what keeps me busy, and that's what has to mean that I uh, be innovative to make sure I can get everything done in the day. Now, talking about getting everything done in the day, looking down here, 800 calves, that's a lot of calves to be feeding. And, um, uh, of course, how do you do that, reducing labour? Um, I don't, I'm not actually doing 800 this year. I've, I've not back to 5.30, but last year I did do 800. Um, and I have for the last wee while, but I've decided that I'm getting a bit old, so I'm going to go down to a, a few less. But it's just all uh, good systems, um, pumps and, and hoses and no lifting, no very little heavy lifting, um, and just having good raceways and pens and just good systems. Really. And some of these in terms of this um, compartment feeders to ensure that they're getting the correct amount of milk, that's a very special part of it as well. Um, it is for me because I'm all, all milk powder um, and that's the really expensive part after you've bought the calf is, is the milk. So you want to make sure that they get their two litres of milk a day because they're, they're on once a day two litres. Um, so it's really, really important that they all get that. And if you've got a big cup, on your milk feeder beside a smaller calf, then they don't stand a chance. So um, that's why I go with compartment feeders. Mm. And of course, you've said that speed is not um, the driver, that uh, being efficient doesn't mean you need to be too quick, especially when it comes to the the welfare of these calves. Um, So how do you put in, and what are your recommendations to those listening in terms of uh, good systems that you've you've found really work and that it's just made your life a whole lot easier? Um, my best system is my eye for looking at the animals to check that they are doing okay. So if you ha- haven't got a good eye for animals, then it isn't going to be a good outcome. So, um, yeah, just really watching and attention to detail and making sure you're not rushing like crazy. You're just taking time to, to make sure that everything is getting fed properly. Um, and if there's any health issues, that you, you deal with them really quickly because it doesn't take long for a, a, a small calf to go downhill. Mm. I understand from the judges, from what I've been sent through, was that you've made a clever blend of old, i.e., um, you know, by eye, uh, as well as, of course, embracing new technology when it comes to irrigation. Can you share a little bit more about what you do there? Um, the irrigation, I've just, well, it's not that really newish anymore. Everyone's got pivots, but um, it was all border dike irrigation before, and so we've, we've swapped over to pivots and I put in storage um, as well, because I think that's pretty important. I don't think there's enough storage um, in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and, yeah, so just being able to grow fodder beet so that the calves that I rear, I can now finish um, through our, our heavy winter, hard winters that we have in the Mani Toto. And we'll certainly we'll be talking to James Shaw after the break, um, Angela. We'll talk to him about water storage. Yeah. But what about some of those technologies that you can put now around irrigation um, through centre pivots in terms of apps and telemetry for soil moisture, etc.? Yeah, so I've got soil moisture meters under um, all three pivots, and then on one where I've got uh, variable rate of irrigation, I've got two meters under that one. To, to because it's on such different soil types, so I know I can really keep track of what what I'm doing, and I'm not over irrigating or, or trying not to under irrigate. But sometimes in the Manitoto summers, it's pretty hard to not under irrigate. Um, yeah, that, and um, it's all on my phone. I, I use Garda Farm on my phone, so I can turn my pivot on if um, I'm away. I can still turn it on and still have things working while I'm not here. And um, I just can't think. Of and, yeah, and, of, and of course, I think the judges are really quite impressed by the scale right. of what you've taken on, of course, in, in support with your husband, um, Grant Williams. But I mean, how important is it in terms of that support network around you when you're farming? And particularly, I shouldn't say this, but when you're a woman as well. Um, so I, pretty much you just need your support around you to, for the experts. Um, there's not too much you can't do physically on the farm if you think about it, mm. but um, it's for the experts and their, their advice because um, it's important that you, you, you take that on board of, of, of what, and listen to what 
other people and their ideas and, um, yeah. It's, it's important to listen. Do you believe that uh, we are in a time of a lot of uncertainty and um, change with the lack of the support to come down that pipeline for farmers? Uh, yeah, I, that's part of the reason why I entered the Balance Farm Awards because there is so much uncertainty and we're not telling our story well enough. So if we get out there and tell our story and people appreciate what we're doing and then we might get some more support um, from those those people that should be supporting us but aren't, i.e. the government. <laughs> Um, and what would be your main messages to people like we've got Minister James Shaw on in terms of, um, you know, what great work that you are doing and where you'd like some more attention? Um, I just think that some of the regulations that they're going to hoist upon us are quite ridiculous. And if they want us to produce high-quality, sustainable product to pay our overseas debt off, then they better start helping us out a little bit by not having such ludicrous rules. Thank you so much and congratulations on behalf of us all, Angela, on your win. What a great way of taking out something where you, I'm sure you probably um, take it for granted day to day. I shouldn't probably assume that, but, you know, in terms of a, a, a when there's, how, how sorry, it's a, it's a question, how rewarding is it when someone comes in? Because farming without benchmarks around is, and then someone says, actually, well done, you're doing a good job for something you just do day to day. Yeah, it was really cool, actually. I really enjoyed that part of it um, because normally I'm just sort of here by myself um, toodling along, minding my own business. So, yeah, it's been great to have that those people come in and say that I am doing a good, good job. Yeah, pretty cool. And lastly, I, every time I talk to a Balanced Farm Environment Award winner, I always love to get um, your feedback on the process and encouraging others to be a part of it. Um, yeah, I do encourage other people to be part of it. It was a last sort of minute thought for me to enter um but i just thought it was time to do something like that so yeah no good process good fun good people the judges were great and it makes you look at your business to make sure that you're um, doing what you ought to be doing and you are sustainable and you're environmentally uh doing doing the stuff right environmentally so um yeah no it's great Really good. Oh, Angela, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing from you um, from my home area of Central Otago. Good on you. Keep up the great work. And, uh, of course, we, as I said there, we're going to have James Short, Minister uh, of Climate Change and, of course, co-leader of the Green Party, up next after the break. Um, sorry, it is pre-recorded, so I'd love to take your questions to him. Sadly, I wasn't able to get him on live, but we did get him. Finally, we did get him. Uh, so, as I said, uh, coming up after the break, uh, Minister James Short. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse feed. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But in farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. We're a large deer farm and very proud deer farmer at that. I grew up here as a little boy. It is just a, an amazing lifestyle. I, I could never live in a city ever again. Just the big open spaces and just the peacefulness of it all. I think deer are very majestic, very intelligent animal. Having deer that are under pressure or anything like that or overstocked, you know, they really don't perform as well. You should really be spreading them out on beautiful pastures, keeping them happy. A happy deer is a, is a good deer. And good feed, you know, good grass. We renew our pastures all the time in the paddock, so we're always getting the best quality grass. Well, I guess in the wild, they, they don't have the luxury of the grass that we put in front of them here as a farm animal. I believe that we've got some of the best English type deer in the country, if not the world. And to associate our brand with Silver Fern Farms brand is, um, works for us. 
without the likes of Silverfern Farms, then there's no point doing this. So they're very, very important for us. I'm uh, Mark Tapley, very proud suppliers of venison to Silverfern Farms. Well, in what is being described by the Green Party as a transition package to more sustainable farming systems in New Zealand, with almost $300 million earmarked in the agricultural policy recently released, the party is hoping to introduce a fertiliser levy, effectively a tax on the use of synthetic nitrogen, and the ban of the use of palm kernel, leaving farmers nervous on feed options as we head into uncertain times as we farm and grow under a warming climate. Joining us now to discuss is Green Party co-leader James Shaw. Kia ora James, and firstly welcome to Serious Country, it's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I think this is the first time that we've had this opportunity, so I appreciate it. Of course, um, heading into an election, we do have a lot to cover. First off, set us the scene Do you, on your successes uh, under a coalition with Labour in the last three years. Well, look, I, I think that for the first time that we were in government with ministers, uh, we've actually demonstrated that we can punch above our weight class. I mean, we've only got eight members of parliament in total. Uh, and um, the thing that I'm most proud of uh, is having reached across the aisle and worked with National and created a, a cross-party consensus on the on the long-term direction o- over climate change. Because, of course, that has been something that's been very contentious in New Zealand. And it's been very difficult for business to invest because – you know, they're just not sure, you know, which way things are going to swing at any given election. Um, and so what we've managed to do is to kind of create a stable policy environment, which means that you should see uh, some significant investment decisions over very long time periods. Um, and and I'm, I'm really pleased about that. Your latest agricultural policy announcement uh, has multiple elements in there that go more extreme left on Labor's existing policies, in particular 190 kilos per hectare of uh, a synthetic nitrogen cap wasn't far enough that you wanted to bring in a levy. Why? Well, I, we think that it is important to send a price signal. So we have set it quite low. Uh, you know, we looked at what the cost would be to the average dairy farm, and it's about $1,500, which is enough, I think, to make people think, can we be more efficient with this uh, and, and reduce the liability um, without actually uh, putting anybody at risk? On the flip side, um, 100% of that revenue goes back into uh, the farming community via that $300 million fund that we're talking about. So the money becomes a contribution to what is actually a pretty large uh, package of support from the taxpayer for the transition. So let's call it a tax because that effectively is what it is in other ways of petrol to roads and tobacco to health. So effectively uh, coming out with more tax uh, to redistribute to your intentions. However, in this Farmers Weekly, article you've stated you're not going to be overly prescriptive with where it's being said and of course helping indebted farmers get off the hamster wheel is that effectively the green party subsidizing farming well one of the things that we've heard very clearly from farmers around the country over the course of the last three years is that they uh, want to move in this direction um, but people are feeling quite stuck and the one thing that Virtually every farmer that I've said to is, look, we want to do this. It's just we need a bit of support on the ground. And so, you know, in our view, um, without kind of trying to create some massive bureaucracy or anything like that, we're saying, look, why don't we just start with, a, you know, a fairly significant pot of money um, and then, you know, different farmers can apply to that for grown, uh, sorry, loans or grants or specialist support, whatever is needed in any particular location uh, to help make it. Because we understand, you know, different farm types, different soil conditions and climate conditions, uh, the different starting point that different farm systems are at mean that, you know, one size is definitely not going to fit all. Absolutely. And when it comes to that too, one size definitely doesn't fit all in terms of $300 million being anywhere near enough. In regards to the freshwater policy, I am hearing from the ground, we're getting close to a billion dollars it's going to cost for farmers in New Zealand to meet that. So, I mean, as well as all of uh, the other elements around it, um, do you strongly believe that this is enough or is it just another figure for voters? 
Well, you've got to start somewhere. Um, so you, if you take that 700 million that we've put in to support the sector through the freshwater um, program, this $300 million, that is a billion dollars worth of support. We know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, but this is an initial commitment. And um, you know, the view that I take is let's see how it goes. And if we get a couple of years down the track and, and it looks like you know, we need to uh, crank it up, then let's make that decision at the time. And also palm kernels on the table. There is a lot of direction already happening on the ground. I mean, you look at what Fonterra is doing and Sinlay to eradicate palm kernel from our system. So this is already underway. But the thing is, James, we also have a catch-22. It's called drought. And when we have a drought, we have a lack of feed to feed the immediate need. So, of course, one thing is uh, great for the long term, but short term, you can't just ban things. Well, the, the I mean, as you say, actually, PKE is getting managed down by the sector because people recognise the horrendous cost uh, of creating that PKE in the first place. I mean, the um, burn off of much of Indonesia's rainforest and the replacement with um, with um, palm plantations is, has a horrendous effect, um, not just in Indonesia but on all of Southeast Asia, with you know um, smoke clouds and so on affecting neighbouring countries. So people do want to get out of it um, and and there is a lot as you say there's a lot of activity happening there I, I would say that uh, we just need to be a bit more innovative and look for uh, other uh, opportunities and I would say uh, that New Zealand grain uh, growers would be a perfectly good substitute Okay, in terms of uh, how farmers are already progressing, they're just calling out for yourself as Minister for Climate Change to understand things from the ground. And one particular area is, of course, sequestration from native trees and riparian planting. And the other Mm. is in terms of mapping our soils to, one, protect them from urbanisation sprawl, but also, two, to be able to understand sequestration of our soil carbon, both which those two areas are not gaining any attention. Uh, actually, um, we have heard that, uh, and so um, last year uh, we asked Ministry for the Environment and Ministry for Primary Industries to essentially reopen that work program, and, and that's aligned with the work that we're doing through the Hewaka Ekanoa work program with the sector on uh, the measurement, management and pricing of um, farm-level emissions. So the, the holy grail of what we're trying to get to with that is a farm-level system uh, that looks at all of the sources of of your emissions, um, but also at all of the possible uh, sequestration opportunities that you have on, on farm. And then uh, where we hope to get to is, you know, those two things will be netted off against each other and that'll spit something out at the end. And if you're above the number, you might get pinged. And if you're below it, then you get a reward for it. That, that's kind of where, where we eventually want to get and to. Talk- so we are looking at soil sequestration. We are looking at small non-forest um, planting like riparian strips and shelter belts uh, and things like that. And let's talk about reward, because to be able to be in the black, we can't be in the red. Every farmer in New Zealand wants to achieve this current government's goal of being the most sustainable food and fibre producers Mm. in the world. Yet you know what wool prices are doing and also to the struggles without um, some layoff and legislation to ensure that we've got delayed rainfall, i.e. water storage, ability to achieve profitability behind the farm gate to achieve your goals. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I actually don't think that we've made as much Uh, progress on water storage as I would have liked to in this last uh, three-year term and it is something that I'll be um, putting a bit more pressure on the system to respond in the next three years. When we made the decision very early on about the funding for the really large scale, the sort of industrial scale irrigation schemes, Cabinet did actually say, you know, that we, we didn't like we weren't excluding all water storage and we, we had a series of principles for the kind of water storage that we would support but there hasn't been a lot of activity off the back of that and that's really what I want to build on and make sure that we are actually developing really good resilient um, a sort of distributed network of water storage uh, in our most vulnerable regions. Yeah, and there's a lot of ideas that were on the table prior as well that now everybody's coming back to were a good idea in the first place. And I'll talk about the Hawke's Bay as an example of that. Um, just to close, in regards to wool, uh, it is the most sustainable renewable fibre, a sequestration of carbon. It is in an all-time low. What will the Green Party do to avoid the animal welfare issue which 
which is the farmers are now paying to take wool off the back of these animals. Yeah, I think uh, you you might be hinting at the um, building for the future program that we've got. Uh, which is it's only in a sort of reasonably early stage of, of maturity, but we do want to start sourcing our construction materials um, from uh, natural, um, uh, you know, woods and fibres um, around around New Zealand. Um, and so the idea is saying actually the more sustainable a building is uh, in terms of its construction, then by definition you're actually using uh, natural materials um, from as close to the point of use as possible. And so that includes wool. Uh, and so, as you say, it's a fantastic insulating material. Uh, and I think that there is there are real opportunities there for, uh, for the sector. And of course, politics. Where it has been, there has been certain things floating around that um, the potential to be in a position to go with either side could potentially be on the table. James, are you feeling secure that uh, Labour will have you back? And is the door open with Judith? Well, I, I, I mean, frankly, it and. And answer to the second part of the question is fairly academic. If you look at the polling, um, I think the question will be really how large is the is the majority that Labor get. Um, I do think that we will be not just back in Parliament, but also back in government with the Labor Party. I think that we have done a good job over the last three years uh, of working in partnership with them, and that we have demonstrated that we are a stable and responsible partner in government um, and can be trusted to deliver on some of the really thorny issues that are facing the country. Like the economic recovery. Absolutely. Uh, so, and look, I, I know we are in an extraordinary time right now. Um, we, I think right across the political spectrum, um, there is a broad level of consensus, not 100%, but a very broad level of consensus that we do need to uh, put significant amounts of liquidity into the economy to stimulate the economy and to get us through this particular downturn to the maximum extent possible. Lots of arguments about what you put that stimulus towards, of course, um, and that's entirely appropriate in an election campaign. The view that I have uh, is that in particular in the fields of the built environment, we had a 30-year deficit. So if you're talking about rural roads uh, or urban um, public transport systems uh, or uh, housing, obviously, um, or our schools and our hospitals uh, or in our water storage uh, and our three waters infrastructure, you know, we've got these enormous and very expensive problems that we have been storing up for several for several decades. Um, and because we, that, you know, all of those chickens were largely coming home to roost about the time that the pandemic hit. And so what I would argue is that given that we have this requirement to inject enormous sums of, of capital into the economy right now, um, then we ought to be, putting every dollar of that stimulus to work, trying to resolve some of those long-term challenges facing the country. Otherwise, future generations will end up paying twice, once to pay off the debt that we're running up to get ourselves through the crisis and once to deal with those unresolved issues that we've failed to resolve so far. Thank you so much, James. It's been a pleasure uh, you joining us here on Serious Country, co-leader for the Green Party, James Shaw. Well, and what? And for those who may have missed that from the start of the show, it was a pre recorded interview with James Shaw uh, earlier today. Um, of course, we had him lined up last Monday, and we I did promise you I would ensure that he came on. So I was trying to make the most of fitting in a lot of topics there. I'd love to know your thoughts after listening to that interview with James. Uh, and please, wherever you are watching live across the web, put in the comments below. I can see them here. And we are talking tonight on a bit of a fun topic around fashion. I and mean, there's been some pretty crazy fashion, but things come in cycles now, don't they? And you go, oh, never thought that would come back into fashion. That's what my mum always says. Um, Wendy has hit me up, though. She said that she loves her ripped jeans. Go you, Wendy. It's just sometimes I think it's where they're ripped, if you know what I'm saying. Um, John Williams now. John, I'm sorry I didn't reply to your email. I'm going to do it here live. He wants to say platform soles and heels in the early 70s when he was already tall and thin. You're still already tall and thin, John. Now, John wrote me an email 
And I should actually probably quote John, but uh, John wanted to ensure that I was a girl of two halves when it came to my criticism of the North and the North versus South game, and that I would acknowledge that the Taranaki taking home the log of wood from Canterbury in the weekend. Congratulations, Taranaki. Yes, the North Island do have some very good rugby players and teams as well. Uh, and I certainly do have to take it uh, credit where credit is due. Now, Tay talking on the flip side, though, what about this Bledisloe Cup game that could end up at Forsyth Bar as stadium in Dunedin as opposed to Auckland due to these lockdown restrictions? Let's wait and see where that one goes. Hey, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us in the comments. And uh, of course, I love your thoughts on the topics that we have coming up. Should have talked to James a, a little bit about solar, but I definitely have coming up to close the show uh, a fantastic innovation, basically providing solar panels to your farming and growing operation at zero capital outlay. This was an idea that was born between two cousins around a campfire. But before we get to that, we've got Hugh Stringleman up next from Farm Weekly and a big overview of everything Fonterra. This is Sarah's Country. Balance has its own team of innovation specialists. It's our job to lead the way, working with some of the most cutting edge science and research. We've got partnerships with some of the best suppliers in the world, so our farmers get the very best products for New Zealand farms. And in every region across the country, the conditions are very different, and farmers and growers' needs are too. That's why we're always looking for solutions that are just right, like here at our Huntley Service Centre. And here in Canterbury, we've got a self-service silo, so I can pick up fit when it suits me. And here in Morrinsville, we've got a world-class mill. That means that we can safely deliver our customers with the freshest, highest quality feed and minerals. It's about putting the customer first because that's what drives our business. We've been focusing on faster turnaround of orders. We've got to get the right products to the right places at the right times. Here in Taranaki, we've got New Zealand's only urea manufacturing plant. It's where we create our premium sustained fertiliser. We're supplying nationwide and working locally. By getting to know you and what you want to achieve, we can help you get there. And with the new My Balance platform, Balance has put my farm at my fingertips. In fact, we offer support in all sorts of ways, sharing the best nutrition practice with farming families across the country. Whether we're talking about animal health, farm productivity, or looking after our natural environment, sustainability underpins everything we do. We use our local expertise and the latest tools to help farmers and growers navigate the changing regulations, so you can leave your farm in great shape for the future. And we can be really accurate avoiding areas like wetlands and waterways with our award-winning Spread Smart Tech. It makes the job far safer, more efficient and gives you the best results. When you've got access to that kind of know-how, you've got the support you need to make sure you're farming sustainably. It's that kind of thinking that'll keep us going for generations to come. Together creating the best soil and feed on earth. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it in talcum powder, leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. Well, in this week's Farmers Weekly, in front page, Hugh Stringleman covers over Fonterra's welcome return to profitability in the 2020 financial year uh, that came out last week. Despite the global disruption of COVID-19 and the directors uh, making a modest five cents a share dividend, joining us now to discuss is uh, Farmers Weekly journalist Hugh Stringleman to discuss uh, Fonterra's healthy result. Hugh, Fonterra has posted $659 million profit and, of course, suggesting farmers $7.19 a kilo milk solids. Was this in line with what you expected? Yes, I think that signaled that they would um, return something like that profit. And obviously the milk price is, uh, is forecast all along, so that you know, it would be very unusual if they came out with a a major change to the full, uh, milk price right at the end of the 
of the season. So I think um, farmers will be quite uh, uh, relieved that everything's worked out well and that, uh, you know, this is a, a recovery from two bad years. Mm, and Chair, outgoing Chair John Monaghan said that the company was match fit going into this pandemic. Uh, but of course, reducing debt is still in their focus. What else could be on that chopping block to achieve this? They have to get rid of their China Farms uh, venture, which has uh, soaked up an awful lot of money, I think at least $500 million over five years. Um, and they're trying to find some buyers and I guess logically the buyers would be Chinese uh, farming interests or local government or, or even central government. So um, it's going to take quite a long time, I would think, to come up with a, uh, a good result for that. Now, of course, we've got pending director elections. We've got incoming chair uh, Peter McBride. Uh, Fonterra, as well as of Miles Hurrell being in the seat now for, for some time, the cooperative is certainly changing uh, into a different directive. What's your thoughts on the skill sets across the four candidates that have been announced so far? And where do you believe this could see, uh, showcase the, the company moving forward? Well, it would be unusual if Brent Goldsack didn't get returned because he's only a one-term director and he's got very good uh, credentials and background. Uh, the three other contenders, Mike O'Connor, Nathan Guy and Cathy Quinn, are very strong candidates. And this uh, independent assessment process that they go through uh, tends to, you know, raise the, the level of the of the of the candidates because you've got to be pretty committed to even go in into or make your name, you know, declare your interest in the first place and then to go through the fairly searching examination, I would think, by the by the assessment panel and uh, and then, yeah, go through the election on top of that. So uh, those, those four candidates plus several others possibly uh, will go around uh, farmer meetings over the the next uh, month or so. Yeah, certainly not something foreign to uh, former Minister of Agriculture, Nathan Guy. And, <clears throat> excuse me, with regards to um, Fonterra examining its cooperative structure, what do you believe would be a, a good outcome from this to ensure that debt's reduced but dividends are still remain uh, attractive to farmers? Well, I think that's been the main problem up, up to date of the trading among farmers uh, system, which has now gone uh, eight years and has only paid a reasonable dividend in probably two out of those eight years. And therefore, the unit investors have not uh, received much in the way of a yield or return on their investment. And they are now essential uh, to provide an open market for uh, farmer shareholders themselves to um, to sell out when they want to. And so they've got almost contradictory objectives here. You've got to try and uh, make it a stable um, uh, share market so that it's, uh, you know, if somebody can sell, sell when they want to or buy when they want to. Um, and then you've also got to try and treat uh, two completely different uh, categories of shareholders. Um, Equally, and that's what the principles of the of the uh, the review uh, state that that's their intention to try and achieve that. Well, they've been trying for for eight years and they haven't achieved it yet. So uh, it'll need something fairly uh, clever, to, I think, to in the way of a capital restructure to uh, to re reconcile these sort of um, conflicting objectives. And who to close, in the first lift in a couple of months, the GDT uh, came up 3.6%. You're keeping a close eye on this every fortnight. Uh, the volatility in food service, do you think Fonterra is on track to maintain a positive uh, profit going into the next 12 months? I think um, there'll be a lot of interest in how well dairy markets behave or perform um, with this sort of COVID uh, wave, which is still, you know, racing around the world in places like India and and, uh, and Africa. So 
um, it's really too early to say whether that was going to adversely affect the milk price. Um, but their their forecast, Fonterra's forecast, is a very wide one. You know, it's got a dollar between the top and the bottom, and uh, I think it should be possible to come come in somewhere within that range. Um, but you know, we've only had three months of the se- two months of the season so far, and so there's a long way to go. Mm. Hey, thank you so much, Hugh Strangleman, journalist there, very experienced journalist, and particularly focusing in dairy is uh, Farmers Weekly's uh, Hugh Strangleman to joining us as multiple different stories across this week's Farmers Weekly, following Fonterra's annual results, the GDT, and of course the restructure of the co-op ahead of these director elections. Hugh Stringleman, front page of Your Farmers Weekly with Fonterra's looking good. And as you carry on through the paper, multiple different stories around uh, the issues that Hugh spoke about and, of course, opportunities with Fonterra's direction going forward. Coming up after the break to close the show, as part of the new thinking section in Farmers Weekly, we are going to talk to one of the co-founders of Solar Agri from Peter Saunders. How can you capitalise on this new grid of rural solar electricity with zero capital outlay? Very cool innovation from Canterbury up next to close on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. Growing a better world takes courage. It takes foresight and vision. It's about dreaming big, then being brave enough to follow that dream through. To create a world where food is plentiful, soils are healthy, and rivers run crystal clear. A world where we grow more with less, where livestock is tended to with care. Energy is friend, not foe, and waste is a valuable resource. This is the world you're already shaping through imagination, innovation, and determination. So as small steps become huge leaps, you move boldly forward. And Rabobank is there beside you to help grow a better world together. Now, New Zealand dairy farms can get solar electricity and large-scale battery storage at a zero capital outlay. This is something that's very exciting as there is predictions and forecasts that by 2050, our energy costs are going to double. Now, joining us from North Canterbury uh, is Pete, one of the co-founders, Peter Saunders, alongside Hamish Hutton, who came up with this idea around a campfire and of course have been attracting some serious attention from investors really looking forward to understanding how this works and peter joins us now good evening uh, peter how are you going very well sir how are you so solar agri is uh, the new player on the rural electricity scene but with a difference can you explain how it works yeah so uh, we uh provide farmers with a solar and battery system uh, to meet the uh, requirements of their shed mainly. We're not really looking at irrigation uh, at the moment, although that will be coming down the track. Um, And basically, we offer them a fixed tariff over um, a 20-year period, so on a power purchase agreement or PPA, Um, and there's no capital outlay for them. We cap the... uh, the tariffs that they pay, uh, it'll only go up by CPI. Um, so it's a pretty um, enticing offer. Um, and we also have pretty competitive rates at the moment. So uh, we think um, it's well worth a look for farmers. Okay, so when the, I, you know you hear zero capital outlay, you go, hang on a minute, where's the catch? And how long will I be locked in for? 
Well, the catch is uh, you are locked in for 20 years, but uh, you're also locked in for the for the tariff. So um, the tariff will only go up by CPI, as I said. Uh, the other, the only other thing we ask is that uh, we get about between quarter and half a hectare within reasonable proximity of the shed, so about 150 metres um, or closer, preferably, um, so that we can put the array on. Uh, and that's on a lease, but it's a peppercorn lease, so um, as farmers know, peppercorn doesn't mean too much. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, basically a little bit of uh, space next to the shed to put the battery, um, and then off we go. And so no capital outlay pretty much means no capital outlay. Okay, so we, let's talk about this and similar to sequestration of carbon and being rewarded for that. So therefore, why would I pay for the power if you're utilising my land to be able to then put back into a grid? Wouldn't it be a bonus for a farmer to get free power if they're giving over the land? Um, well, they're not giving over that much land. I mean, quarter to half a hectare is not a particularly large area. In fact, you'd be surprised how small it is once it's fenced in. Um, I think also it's fair to say, uh, well, Richard Stalker, who, who's got our system on, on his farm, uh, reckons it's probably one of the most profitable parts of his farm because uh, over time it's going to save him a lot of money um, as, as uh, power prices go up. And, uh, and also there's a number of other benefits. Um, we're working on a, um, making sure that the system can pick up uh, short-term uh, power outages so if the power goes down for a couple of hours, then the battery will be able to take over. Well, that, that means that a lot of farms who are thinking about investing in um, uh, generators and things like that won't have to worry about that sort of thing. Uh, the other side of it is that, and, and it's quite funny, that we, we really started on this journey um, late in 19, uh, sorry, 2017. And as you know, 2017 was pretty brutal from a political perspective. Um, after the election, most farmers sort of came out of a punch, punch trunk, sort of wondering why they'd been picked on for the for the uh, for the election cycle. And uh, there's definitely some some good uh, sustainability credentials that come out of it. Um, so yeah, it's, we like to think that it, it offers more than just a a, um, a good tariff, and and uh, we hope that. Um, there's more. There's more than just one string to our bow. Reliability is certainly one of those reasons that you reach for the diesel can and pour it into a generator, and particularly from an insurance perspective, when in, definitely when it comes to dairy, I mean it's such a valuable loss to milk um, in that production when that power goes out, particularly also uh, in the height of summer when those um, pivots go out because of power as well. I mean, how how much assurance can you give with the gruntiness of these batteries, and is there any sort of work that you're doing alongside with insurance companies to to ensure to make sure that this could be a very sustainable part of our future with adverse events weather events yeah um well as we're talking uh off air i, I think um batteries are going to be the way forward when it comes to picking up the grids issues um there's no doubt you just have to look across to australia and see what's happening in south australia and uh they were in dire straits three or four years ago. They were constantly in a brownout situation. And uh, um, Elon Musk turned up, put his big battery in, um, and it's actually picked up their grid significantly. It's not perfect still, but uh, they've all, they're also doing a lot of trialling with rooftop and battery solutions to um, with, uh, for VPPs and things like that as well. So battery batteries um, definitely have the ability to, to pick up things immediately um, as soon as uh, as the grid goes down. So from a farm perspective, it is possible and we our systems will be um, or are to the point where they're basically islanding and so they can um, uh, pick up immediately and just carry on seamlessly, which means the cups don't fall off. You don't lose a couple hundred litres down the drain. You don't have ECAN turning up the next day and uh, you don't lose revenue. Um, which is quite helpful, really. Um, but, yeah, the biggest story, I think, is the benefits we can offer to the networks as well uh, and helping them uh, with demand response, which is when the grid gets to an overload situation, usually in the winter and the evenings, but also um, when they have frequency or voltage issues uh, and they get a bit wavery, the, the batteries in an area can help stabilise things quickly so that you don't have those problems. And we um, we really see that, um, 
having these systems dispersed out in the rural areas might stop some people's kettles blowing on a regular basis or toasters blowing up, which um, you know is pretty regular in some parts of the country. Um, as you get out to the stringy ends of lines and things like that, um, it gets quite hard to, to manage these problems. So mm, mm. Having, having a fleet of batteries out there definitely uh, will help these situations. And with low lake levels as well, um, as the climate changes dramatically, and uh, rainfall dissipates, of course, taking on board and harnessing the sun. I'd really love to close on your learnings when you are doing your research worldwide. How is New Zealand's attitude? Are we really behind the times when it comes to our acceptance that this is that solar is a part of our future, or are we leading in lots of ways? It's been really interesting. Um, when we started this journey, uh, there was quite a lot of surprise that New Zealand was even capable of. Uh, well, or, you know, capable, that's not quite the right word, but suitable for solar, I think is probably the better way to put it. And uh, that was from some large uh, solar manufacturers, particularly panel manufacturers. Um, once we started actually doing the, uh, our research, um, it became quite clear that particularly places like Canterbury, um, but most most of New Zealand actually, um, above Reefton, all of that area above there is actually really good for solar. And so... Um, I think solar's actually got a huge opportunity or potential in New Zealand. Um, our, our, uh, we've been amazed by the uh, interest uh, shown by farmers. Um, we thought it might be a bit of a hard, hard talk or a hard sell, but it's you know there's, there's definite interest and genuine interest out there um, among farmers for this this type of technology. Um, we find that most farmers are actually pretty open-minded to. Um, to any kind of technology if it helps them make their farm more sustainable or more efficient or whatever it happens to be. So, I don't, yeah, I don't see this being any different to most other technologies out there. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more solar, but I think you know, we're going to see a lot more renewable generation in general. So wind, I think there's a huge opportunity for tidal generation. Um, there's some other things that we'll, we'll probably see come out. Hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen is going to be massive. Tractors and trucks in the future are all going to be driven, driven by hydrogen. And funnily enough, you can make hydrogen out of or use solar to generate hydrogen. So, yeah, it's some... Yeah, I think that the energy future in New Zealand and around the world is awesome. And I, I really think that uh, a lot of the carbon issues that we um, we're all concerned about now and we're genuinely concerned, and I think there's good reason for that. Um, but humans are funny old animals. We keep coming up with ways of fixing our problems, sometimes a bit too late, but hopefully not too late on this situation. So. Yeah. And Peter, um, from all of the farmers that I know across the country, when you've got an offer on the table, which is um, – no money down and saving them money uh, on top of that of course if they can uh, be more profitable and sustainable at the same time she's a she's a done deal uh, and of course we had James Shaw earlier on the show so hopefully he uh, embraces more and more what you do and support it congratulations on everything yourself Peter Saunders uh, co-founder there with Hamish Hutton from Solar Agri the new thinking in this week's Farmers Weekly and before you go uh, I'm just going to flick back there to Peter before he sneaks away. Peter, I did ask you for that to have ready. Worst fashion in history, or if not best decade of, his, of fashion. Uh, worst fashion was shoulder pads. Yes. In the late 80s. And I think fashion. the best decade was the 20s. <laughs> Great Gatsby styles. Exactly. Loved it. Oh, fantastic. I'm sure you remember it well. Uh, that's been <laughs> Peter Saunders, the co-founder of Solar Agri. And, of course, they are looking for pilot farms uh, to partake in this. Of course, it's a hectare of land and uh, you get reduced electricity and across your business and your operation. Fantastic innovation and more and more coming through uh, through the new thinking piece in Farmers Weekly. It's one of my favourite parts of the paper, but, you know, me, an internal optimist, always about opportunities. And tomorrow night's show, we have uh, some fantastic journalism coming through. James Allen from Ag First is talking about urging farmers to consider alternatives in the face of ongoing 
drought conditions each summer. Uh, Peter Wren Hilton is on his way out of Agritech New Zealand, but certainly not leaving the industry, and has left uh, the Agritech sector in better stead. I'm trying to track down some more people with regards to the live export story. I have heard today there, ha- there may be some developments to that, and uh, look forward to bringing you that tomorrow. And potentially we may be talking about cannabis. So you worried about the legalisation of recreational use of cannabis on your farming operation uh, in terms of staff's usage. Lots of great stories in your Farmers Weekly out now hitting your rural mailboxes. Serious Country is on demand on podcast uh, and I do absolutely love having your feedback via email sarah at seriouscountry.com or drop in to the DMs across social media. I had some fantastic response to the story we did with Fee Beard uh, and I was sent a lot of videos from New Zealanders who have worked on those live export boats and the condition of those cattle to me, from my eye, look pretty good. 50 kilos of live weight gain on the journey. Certainly there's a lot of people who care uh, in that entire process and uh, I look forward to continuing to follow this because it is having a dramatic effect uh, back here at home as well as of course on the families of those missing. Um, From Golf Livestock One again we continue our condolences um, and support during this time. Or we'll be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Serious Country across Farmers Weekly uh, and, of course, SeriousCountry.com. It's been an absolute pleasure being with you. And in the meantime, good night and go well. This is Serious Country.